Hello, my name is Christian uh, and I'm a video coding engineer. So um, I have to do with video codecs all day long in and around codecs and whatever is connected to codecs and media workflows. And something that I wanted to do is give an overview of um, the basics of video coding, basically tear open a video coder, a video encoder and decoder and take a look inside and see what makes them go and what makes them so efficient. Um, because um, yeah, I, I guess a lot of you guys are working with codecs and encoders and decoders and media workflows, but never have taken a look under the hood and really uh, taken a look into what makes these encoders and decoders tick and how do they work? How are they uh, able to give us the bit streams and the quality that we see uh, in modern workflows? So uh, just a first note at the beginning, um, everything that I'm talking about here is basically valid for all codecs. So I'm not going to concentrate on one specific codec. Um, this is something, these are very basic concepts that basically apply to all video codecs that are out there, starting from MPEG-2 and um, AVC, HEVC, VVC, but also uh, VP8, 9 and AV1. All of these are using these basic techniques um, on the inside to, um, to, to give you um, the video encoding and decoding um, results that we see. So first, let's get started and let's take a look at a basic encoder and decoder workflow. Um, let's take a look at the decoder first. So um, um, when we're thinking about a decoder, basically um, to us, it's kind of a black box. Uh, on the left, there's an input, there's a raw bitstream coming in, denoted here by like a, a networking jack. Uh, and on the right, there's an output, which is in this case, yeah, <laughs> HDMI, so raw frames that you can basically send to a display. Um, and that is basically everything that a decoder on the outside is. Um, there's no real settings that you can set, nothing that you can really change about it. It either works or it does not. Those are the two states. Maybe there's like a light on top that says uh, that there has been an error or something, that something cannot be decoded. Um, but that is more or less everything that a decoder on the highest level is. Um, the encoder, of course, uh, works the other way around and, um, um, and is a bit more tricky to configure. So on the left, we have the input, which is raw frames are going in. And on the right, there's a bitstream that comes out. And the encoder or typical encoders have a ton of different settings that you can set and configure. All of different things that you might have seen before, different settings that have to do with uh, different aspects of an encoder, like uh, codec features, um, also like rate control features usually of an encoder, like bit rates or quality settings that you set up. Um, all sorts of different things. And it really depends on the encoder that you're using here and on the codec that you're using, of course, that the encoder is built for. Um, but there's a ton of settings. And something that I want to do in the talk later is to tear open uh, these boxes and take a look on the inside. And then maybe afterwards, um, some of these settings that you see on the outside um, will be a little more clear to you. But first of all, let's go into the uh, why the is this so efficient? Um, the, the claim that I made at the beginning. Um, basically, this is about compression factors and video coding is super efficient. And what I mean with that is um, that it's just, it's unbelievable how many pixels are transmitted with small, small bit streams. So how little bits we need to transmit the video data that we get. And um, in order to visualize that a bit more, I want to I want to compare this to something that you might be more familiar with, with this, which is audio coding and audio transmission. Um, and let's do a comparison here. So the compression factor is basically the, the size of the uncompressed data compared to the size of the compressed data. And let's just take some two, two examples here. So for audio, let's say we have a, um, we have a um, sample rate of 44 kilohertz, 16 bits per sample and two channels. That's basically CD audio, which is 1.4 megabits per second. And then let's take a rather modern video codec. So with today's audio codecs, you can easily compress the CD quality audio at like 96 kilobits per second. And most of the people listening to this will not be able to distinguish this from the uncompressed original. And if we take, if we divide these two, then we can say, we can see the compressed bitstream is about 6.8% of the original size, which is a compression factor of about one over 15. Okay, pretty okay. Let's take a look at the same thing in video. Um, so a very typical thing that you would see in a video today, let's say it's 1080p video, which is 1920 by 1080 pixels. We have uh, eight bits per pixel and we have three planes, R, G, and B, right? So it's a color image. And then we have 24 frames per second. And that sums up to about 1.2 gigabits. 
So we can see we're already in a completely different realm here uh, with regards to like the bits and bit rates. Um, but what about the compressed version? So let's say we have a compressed bit stream with some codec, let's say it's AVC or something like that, at about six megabits, which is pretty generous. Um, and if we divide that um, by the uncompressed bit rate, then we're at about 0.5% um, of the original or a compression factor of about one divided by 200. So that is a whole different, different realm of compression that you can see here. And this is not even like the highest, highest possible compression standards, right? So the six megabits here, with a modern video codec, you can probably do like a 1080p standard encode that you can get here with a with like three or two or even less megabits. It also depends on the content, of, uh, content of course, a bit. But with modern codecs, you can easily achieve also compression factors of like one over 400 or 500. Um, and now, just just another thing that is mind-boggling to me is the if you think about how many bits are actually transmitted per update of a pixel on your screen. So let's say, same example, we have a 1080p video, 20 frame, 10, 24 frames per second. And um, basically you are seeing 1080p pixels on your screen and they are updated 24 times per second. So how many bits are actually transmitted per update of each pixel? If you divide that with the same example, then you get to something like one over eight. So one, 0.125 bits I actually send in the bitstream per pixel. And again, for modern codecs, that's even far less, which is really impressive to me. So you have these many pixels that are updated so often per second, but you're just transmitting a few, a fraction of a bit actually per pixel, per pixel update. And that is really impressive. So how, how is this possible? And the biggest key point here is redundancy. So something that video has is a ton of redundancy. And that is the key on how to remove or how to compress video so efficiently. So here I have an example of uh, three consecutive frames from the Sintel sequence. And um, this is actually a pretty high motion scene. And you can already see that there's a lot of redundancy here, that these, these images all almost look the same, right? It seems like nothing is happening actually. And um, so there's two types of redundancy here that we can see. Um, one, there's spatial redundancy. You can see, for example, the sky is very homogeneous, very um, yeah, just yellow. There's not much happening. So there's a lot of spatial redundancy. And then, of course, on the temporal axis, there's also a lot of redundancy. So not much is changing from frame to frame. And as I said, this is actually a high motion scene. This is not like a still frame. This is a high motion scene where she's running up the stairs here. Uh, and the only real differences you can see between the frames is like, the arm is moving slightly, maybe the whole thing is a bit shifted, but that is it. And uh, this is basically the goal of video coding. You try to remove as much redundancy as possible in order to get a, 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 as far compressed bitstream as possible. Get rid of all of the unnecessary information and just transmit what is new in each frame. That is the idea. So let's get started. The first things, um, the first thing that you do is um, we are not transmitting images in the RGB space. So images are made up of three, typically if they displayed or recorded with a, with a sensor, you get um, red, green, blue images, RGB images, three planes. So that is three times eight bit or maybe more per channel. Um, and the first thing that we do is we transform that into a different color space. And this is the YUV color space, um, which is a luminance channel and two chrominance channels. Um, and these are, yeah, the luminance is just the brightness of each pixel and the two chrominance uh, values are like two vectors uh, that are spanning up the, um, the color space. And then it's just a matrix multiplication in the end to go from and to RGB and YUV and back. And um, yeah, and the first thing that we can already do to, um, to reduce the amount of data that we have to compress um, is that our human visual system it's much more sensitive to the luma information, so to the brightness and to edges in the image as well, than to the color information that has to do with the eye, right? So there's a very little, very little cones in the eye that, that are sensitive to color. And so um, the first thing that we do you, in, in Codex usually is to subsample the chroma and uh, the, the chroma components, the UNV components, basically downscale the width and height by a factor of two. And uh, just by that, we already got rid of 50% of the information that we're compressing. And if you reverse this, um, then yeah, humans at least are not really able to see the difference because of um, the visual system. Okay, so far so good. 
but let's uh, let's dive a bit deeper into what's going in uh, on inside of, of of an encoder or decoder. And um, the basic scheme that all of these video codecs are working with is hybrid block-based video coding. What does that mean? Um, let's break this down a bit. So hybrid. So there's some sort of combination of two things working together here. Um, block-based. So everything seems to be yeah working on a block basis. Um, and then of course there's video coding, which is the last part. And let's uh, let's start off with the block-based scheme because that is the first thing, right? So frames are processed frame by frame, and each frame is first broken up into blocks, which are processed in a certain order. And um, here's an example. So the image is split up into into a um, into a range of blocks, uh, big blocks, and they are processed in a raster scan order usually. So line by line, and then a column by column. And um, uh, the size of these blocks, of these blocks, they're often called macro blocks or super blocks. They have different names depending on the codec. And the size of these also depends on the codec. For example, older codecs like AVC had a maximum block size of 16 by 16 pixels. But for modern codecs, this can go up to like 128 by 128 pixels. So they can become very big. And that is, of course, um, correlated to the types of video that we're encoding, right? In the time of AVC, videos were typically small. HD was still a thing of the future. Um, but now today, uh, HD or 4K or 8K videos everywhere. So um, the video codecs, of course, adapted to this. Also, we have much more processing power available on all devices. So handling bigger blocks is much easier today. And that is the evolution of, of the block sizes of videos. Um, yeah, and um, there's also different, different methods that, this, uh, that these can be processed in. It doesn't have to be one consecutive line of, of blocks. There's also different methods on how the bitstream can be broken up into like subparts that can be processed um, in parallel to utilize multiple threads. Um, one way is to use uh, slices, which is just a just an offset basically in this in this raster scan order for each of the forming like a sub picture that can be decoded at the same time. Um, some other feature that some codecs have is tiling, which uh, separates the images basically into some sub images which are processed in parallel. These are the the, the basic the tools that some codecs have to um, enable some parallelized uh, decoding and encoding um, features. Now we have this block and, and now we have one of these big blocks um, and we're not at the end with uh, splitting these. So um, this is not the smallest size that we will process blocks in. After the first partitioning of the image, we will have another partitioning of the block into smallest coding blocks, into blocks which we will actually use for coding. And um, basically all codecs implement a sort of a tree-based um, splitting structure here. So where each block is split and then another decision is taken if a block is split even further, if it's uh, split even further. And all of these, um, and the splittings, it depends on the codec which ones are allowed. But um, not all splits have to be like into four sub blocks. There's also a codex that allow splitting into uh, doing a horizontal split or a vertical split, or maybe also some asymmetric splits. There's also some codex that don't, where these don't have to be um, rectangulars, by the way, uh, really, so they can also be some other shapes. There's all sorts of different partitionings. But in the end, we arrive at these. Um, coding blocks. So this is this is the smallest um, block size that we will process, and these will then be handled in the coding loop one by one, again in this tree structure. And this is the coding loop. Uh, specifically, this is the coding loop of an encoder, and uh, basically all of these small blocks are handled in this coding loop one by one. They are all parsed through this coding loop. Um, and so on the left, on the top left, all of the blocks will come in. And then the first thing we do is we subtract a prediction for each of the blocks. Um, and this prediction can either be intra-prediction or inter-prediction. Um, and I will go into detail on all of these blocks in a bit, and then we'll take a look at this again. So you don't have to fully understand this now already. Um, and the first thing we do is we form a prediction and subtract that from the original block, which gives us a sort of an error signal. Then there's a transformation stage and a quantization stage. I will get to what that does. Um, then there's some entropy coding to compress the bits into the bitstream, and then there's the inverse process, and then there's something, um, and then the reconstruction is put into some loop filter and a picture buffer. And I will get into into all of the details here. But basically, this is a loop. 
So for, for each block, this loop is traversed uh, one by one by one by one. And that is how the decoder operates, block by block by block. It's block-based. So let's dive into, into all of these different components one by one. Uh, first up, let's start with the intra-prediction. Intra-prediction means we are doing a prediction of a block based on the information that we already decoded in the immediate neighborhood of this block. So in this case, we have a four by four, the white squares here are the, uh, are the pixels that we want to do a prediction for. Um, and the gray uh, blocks in the surrounding are the blocks which have already been decoded. So we have that information available and want to use it for a prediction for our current block. And um, what can we do? Basically, everything is allowed here. So for example, you could just sum up all of the pixels in the surrounding and calculate the average. That would be a DC prediction. That is a prediction mode. Um, or you could do like a linear combination with math. Basically, everything that is, that is working well in software and hardware is allowed here. And all sorts of different codecs have different um, approaches here. But one thing that they all have in common is that they have some sort of directional intra-prediction mode where basically we are taking the existing pixels that we have, the pixel data, and we're extending it um, alongside a certain direction, which can vary, uh, which is then coded into the bitstream, of course, the direction. Um, and then just for each of the pixels that we want to predict, we have to do some sort of some sort of averaging, right? So in this case, I just did an average over the, over the areas below, the, uh, below these lines, and that is what comes out of this. Um, yeah, this is, but again, it depends a bit on the codec, what the precise mathematics is that is used for this prediction, but the principle is always the same. Um, all, it also depends on the codec, how many of these uh, directional predictions there are. Uh, the more modern the codec, typically the more of these directions you have um, and the bigger blocks are allowed and stuff like that. But the basic concept is, is this, this is intra-prediction. Next up is interprediction, uh, or also called motion compensation, where we are um, basically using uh, reference frames, so frames that we have already decoded in the past, and then we are taking information from, from those frames. We're just copying it over. Um, so how it works is we take, a, for the current block that we have, the blue block here, we're going into one of the reference frames that we have available. Um, then we move the blue block according to a motion vector, that vector is encoded in the bitstream. Um, then we copy whatever is under that reference and move it into our current frame, and that is our prediction. That is the concept of motion compensation. And you can already see where that is good for, right? So for example, if you have a scene where stuff is just slightly panning, that is ideal, right? You just have to copy from the reference and not much is changing. Um, but also for other cases, this is very, very helpful for um, re removing the redundancy, basically just copying information instead of transmitting it all over again. Um, next, one thing that, uh, that all of these codecs also do is um, the coding order of frames is not necessarily, or in most cases, is not identical to the uh, display order of frames on screen. So let's say we have uh, three frames here, one, two, three. Um, but we don't encode and decode them in this order in one, two, three, but we, um, we, we dis, dis, disallocate this. Uh, so, so we separate this, these orders a bit. So um, let's say we code the first frame first, but then instead of going on with frame two, we then encode frame three, and then finally we encode frame two, the one in between. And what does that allow us? The big advantage here is um, that now, for all of the frames where we have two references available from the temporal past and future, we can um, do something which is called bidirectional motion compensation. So we can actually copy information from the temporal past and the temporal future. You can already see why that is helpful, right? If you know how a picture looked and how it will look, then you can do a much better prediction on how, how the current block is, um, looks that you are trying to do a prediction for. Um, and that is exactly how bidirectional motion compensation works. It works basically the same as the unidirectional motion compensation. But in this case, we have two reference frames, one in the temporal past, one in the future. We are going into both of them. We are applying two motion vectors. Each of these blocks has their own uh, motion vector encoded in the bitstream. Um, and then we're copying the information, um, copying it all into our current block. And then we're doing some sort of combination of, of these blocks. So um, this can be an average. 
um, but also other weighting algorithms are there depending on the codec. But somehow these are combined to form our prediction for our current block. All right, so so far I've, I've talked about the prediction process where we get a prediction signal. Um, and as I showed, the next step is that we subtract this from the original to form a sort of error message um, or a sort of error signal, which is basically a signal that describes um, how wrong we were with the prediction. Um, and that is something that we add then um, back up in order to get a reconstruction of the original image. Um, and what happens to this um, and to this error signal, we're we are doing uh, the following process. So we are doing a transform, then a quantization, and then, and then the same thing in reverse, inverse quantization, inverse transform. Um, why, what does that do? Well, Encoding these error coefficients is not very efficient in the spatial domain. Um, and so something that we do is we transform it, usually using a DCT transform or like discrete cosine transforms or discrete, discrete sine transforms. Those are the predominant transforms that are used in the video area. Um, and, 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 and that gives us a transformation into a frequency domain, so into coefficients. And um, these transforms, the DCD transform spe uh, specifically has very nice decorrelation uh, properties. So typically pixels are usually very co correlated, right? And that is, the, that is one of the problems when we are encoding this data. And if we do a transform, then suddenly we remove a lot of this uh, correlation between the pixels. And that helps us a lot with, um, with compressing this into a bitstream. So, what is the DCT transform or the discrete cosine transform? Um, I like to, um, I always like to think about it. It's a little bit more visual about um, audio uh, coding or audio transcoding. So if you do a, the DCT is a sort of a frequency transform. So like if you have a, you can imagine an audio signal, right? And then you do a transform from samples to uh, coefficients. Um, then you get a frequency re representation of the audio signal. Right, with low frequencies, medium frequencies, high frequencies, and then um, in the time domain that would correspond to like a frequency, like a sine curve or a DCT, like a cosine curve. And um, the same applies to images, basically the same. So um, the DCT, the coefficients, basically give us a, a weight for each of the base frequencies of the DCT. Um, and then you just have to add up or you have to multiply all of these coefficients with the base coefficients and add them all up and take the average and then you get the reconstructed uh, samples back. Um, the only difference from audio to video is that it's happening in two dimensions. Um, and here I have plotted uh, like the DCT basis uh, transformation functions for an 8x8 eight eight, uh, pixel block. So what I did here is I took a matrix, 8x8 eight eight matrix, uh, or coefficient matrix set everything to zero except for one of the coefficients. So one by one they are set to one and all of the remaining coefficients remain zero and then I'm doing the inverse DCT. That gives us sort of the, um, uh, the, the um, impulse response of the DCT or we can see like the base frequencies that we are using with each of these coefficients. Um, and what you can see here is like on the top left that is the lowest uh, coefficient that we have which is basically yeah, the, the equality coefficient, the frequency is zero, so it's just gray. There's no frequency here at all. And then the higher we go to the right or to the bottom, the higher the frequency in horizontal and where vertical direction gets. And on the bottom right, we have the highest frequency, the highest two-dimensional frequency that we can represent with this DCT, which is basically a yeah, black and white um, checkerboard pattern, right? So it's black, white, black, white. Right. That's the highest frequency. So maximum, minimum, that's the highest frequency that we can map with the DCT. And the DCT coefficients basically give us how, of all of these, um, how do we have to weigh them together, then add everything up to get to the original reconstruction. Um, so how does this help us with a, with a transform? So let's do an actual transform. So here I have a block of pixels, just a sample block that I cut from an original sequence. Uh, on the left, you can see the matrix representation. On the right, you can see the image of the same block. And now let's do the DCT transform of this. And what happens is this. So you can already see that, yeah, a lot of the energy is now actually concentrated on the top left. So in the lower frequencies. And this is something very typical that happens with natural images. Most of the energy is in lower coefficients and the very high coefficients actually don't have that much frequency. And that is the decorrelation effect of this DCT that you can see in action here. 
So how does this help us? So far, we now we just have a range of, of like floating point numbers. How, how does this help us to encode it? Um, this doesn't help us yet. Um, we have to combine this with something called quantization. So we have to quantize these values to, to, to lower values. And what is quantization? Well, in essence, um, quantization is taking a range of this floating point range and quantizing it to one specific value. Um, and then if we do the reconstruction, we just have to put that value there. Uh, it's a sort of a rounding. And uh, of course, we're with every of these rounding operations, we're losing information. And that is the basic thing of quantization. Quantization in a video codec is the one um, main source of error or the one main source of like a loss of information, actually. All of the other components are working more or less perfectly, pixel perfect, they are perfectly invertible, but the quantization is not. That is where we lose the information in the video codec. So if you set up your video codec to have a very low quality, then the quantization will be very high in the codec where all of the information is lost. And, but let's just look at, it. I mean, for example, of course in video codecs, more specific or more, more adapted quantization algorithms are used, but one very basic operation, of, which is uh, quantization, is basically just division and rounding to the next integer. That's a sort of quantization. Not something that is used in video codecs really, but it's, uh, it's a sort of quantization that is very visual. So let's do that. So for example, here, we're just dividing everything by 10, and then we're rounding to the next integer. And that is it. That is what we're doing here. And that is a sort of quantization. And what, can, what we can already see is that well, now a lot of the coefficients are very small and a lot of the coefficients are actually zero. Um, and that is something that helps us a lot. So the smaller the coefficients, the better you can uh, encode them or put them into a bit stream more efficiently. And of course, the higher uh, we do this division. So for example, if we divide by 20, then um, more coefficients become zero um, and so on. And then if we do the inverse process, uh, then we just have to uh, requantize back. So we just have to multiply by the same thing that we divided before. Um, of course, you can see there's, there's an error definitely here, right? So this is not the original values, um, but they are close to it with a certain amount of error. So that is the whole uh, transform and quantization scheme. So on the left here in blue, we're in the pixel domain that we're doing the transformation. Now we have coefficients that we're dealing with. We quantize them. Those quantized coefficients are then actually put into the bitstream. And then we do the inverse process. So we do inverse quantization, inverse transformation. And then we have a reconstruction of the original samples that we put in at a lower quality, typically, depending on how the quantization is set up. Um, but let's look at an example of this whole workflow in action. So here I have an original, uh, an original block, an original 8x8 pixel array. Um, and now let's, let's do this whole process um, uh, transformation and then quantization and then the inverse thing for different setups for the quantization. So let's say we're dividing all the coefficients by a factor of 10, which loses a lot of the information in the original. So that is much, much better compressible than the original um, samples. And uh, what happens is, yeah, you can see it. It's, it's quite close to the original. It's not quite there, right? We can see some noise. We can see that it's not really super close to the original. But there, there's a little bit of drift, but it's, it's a pretty good reconstruction. And now, of course, the higher we choose this division, the, the, the rougher we do the quantization, the worse it gets. So a division, division of 20, it's already pretty bad. Division of 50, where we're getting further away from the original. Division of 100, this is actually very, very little information that we're actually encoding, very little, uh, little energy that we have in the coefficients left here. Um, Division of 200, oh, we're very far away from the original. <laughs> Division of 400, we're completely away. I think actually for this, only like two coefficients are still not zero and the rest is just zero in this case. So next, what happens to these, um, to these coefficients? I said they are encoded into the bitstream and there's a lot of other things that are also encoded into the bitstream. Um, for example, motion information is put into the bitstream, uh, like which prediction modes are used, how the block sizes are. There's a lot of information in that has to be encoded into the bitstream. And um, the core of this is uh, entropy coding, which is a inversible uh, coding scheme, which is using the entropy of the incoming symbols. So the probability if they are one or zero or ABC, it depends on the input, um, in order to do a compression. It's a bit like 
zipping or like GZ. It's a lossless operation that just works on the data to do a compression. Um, but if you tailor this specific to the symbols and if you can do a good prediction on the probability, then you can get a very, very, very good compression efficiency here. And one of the key uh, entropy coding schemes that is dominating in video codings is arithmetic coding, which is a sort of compression algorithm here. And um, because arithmetic coding, if you set it up right, it can go very, very close to the theoretical maximum entropy, uh, minimum entropy of the data that you're compressing if you set it up right. And that is why it's used everywhere, basically in video coding. Um, and down here, I have a table that, that illustrates like how many bits or how many theoretical bits, the entropy of, of a symbol you need, depending on the probability. So let's say you have a bit that is 50% probable to be 100, then you basically can't compress it. <laughs> then that's the worst case. You have to spend one bit per bit on this because there's no way to compress it even more. It's 50-50, you don't know. There's no, no information that you can compress here. And the higher or lower the probability is, um, the lower the entropy gets. And if you have like a 1% chance of a bit being one, then uh, you only need like 0 0.08 bits per symbol or per one or zero that goes into the arithmetic coding engine to put into the bit stream. And that is something that you can achieve with arithmetic, arithmetic encoding very, very nicely. Mm. The last block um, in this coding loop that I didn't go into yet is loop filtering. Um, and what is loop filtering? Basically, yeah, it's a filter in the loop. Um, and anything that is working on pixel uh, pixel images here is allowed here. And um, it really depends on the codec, which which uh, algorithms are used here for filtering the image. The goal always is to, um, to improve the visual quality or the reconstruction quality of the output image. Um, and some filters use information from the bitstream, like motion vectors, where blocks are, um, transform coefficients, even something, all of, all of the information is up for grabs. Um, some don't, it really depends on the codec. They all have very, very different filters that are put into the loop here. Um, but all of them help with the compression efficiency because they are run in the loop. So um, the reconstructed images are then also used for interprediction prediction again. And so you get the gain inside of the loop. But one thing, one thing that all codecs have is some sort of deblocking filter. Um, because as I said, right, we're processing the image block by block by block. And then at the decoder side, we're putting everything back together like a giant jigsaw puzzle. And then of course, where uh, at the places where blocks are meeting, some, it can happen that they don't perfectly align because we process them separately. Um, and then like here on the left, you can see there's like very clear boundaries where the original blocks were that were coded. And then you can do a deblocking filter, which is essentially a smoothing filter across this border um, in order to make it more visually appealing and increase the coding efficiency as well. And on the right, you can see yeah, the block sizes are, the block boundaries are far less visible here. All right, back to the encoding loop. Um, yeah, we're, we're back here with our encoding loop and I hope um, the explanation now with all of the explanation, you can kind of understand what all of these different blocks are. Um, and now let's take another another look at um, an actual block walking through this, uh, through this coding scheme. So first we're generating a prediction, in this case, intra-prediction. Then we're taking that prediction, subtracting it from the original image uh, block, which gives us a transform, some transform coefficients. They are quantized, um, then put into the bitstream, and then the inverse process happens. So we're doing the inverse quantization, inverse transform, which gives us the reconstruction of the error signal. Then we add it to the same prediction again, and that is our reconstruction. And then that is put into the loop filter, or it's used for intra prediction, and then it goes into the picture buffer, which in turn is again used for inter prediction. And the picture buffer is then also where we get the reconstructed images from. And then this is processed block by block by block by block until the whole image has been encoded or decoded. So far, we've only been, look, been looking at the uh, encoding loop, um, but what does the decoder look like? Well, basically each encoder is sort of a decoder. It has to be. The encoder must know what the decoder will do in order to do the right decisions and get to the same conclusions for like prediction and loop filtering and stuff like that. Um, so basically when we uh, just take out the top left part here and reverse the flow through the entropy coding engine, then we have a decoder. So now the bitstream is coming in, we're doing entropy decoding, then we're doing the inverse quantization transformation stuff. And the bottom part of this loop is working as before. It's taking the same information, doing the same predictions, um, doing the same loop filtering, and then 
uh, on the bottom right, the picture buffer will give us the decoded uh, images out. Um, and that is how all video codecs work. So they are always uh, working in sync. So the encoder and decoder are always in sync. There's never drift. So if the encoder and decoder would, um, would not have the same predictions or filter results, then we would call that drift. And that can have uh, catastrophic uh, <laughs> effects if you don't know what the decoder will do in a case. And then they drift apart that gives very bad uh, artifacts usually. So all video codecs are using this locked system where the encoder and decoder are always using the same exact same uh, information for prediction and reconstruction and filtering. Yeah, lastly, I want to show some decoding in action. So basically um, a, um, a decoding uh, of, a, of a frame. So this has been encoded with the HEVC. And now we can see like um, how all of these blocks are in which order they are, they are decoded. So you can see we're, we're doing uh, block by block by block in this uh, sequential order. And then um, each of these blocks is split into smaller ones and you can see how they are processed. You can also see that like for homogeneous areas, uh, typically bigger blocks are chosen for smaller images, uh, for smaller, um, for, for, for areas where there's more detail then the smaller blocks will be chosen. And, uh, and then those, all of those have to be processed one by one by one by one. And now you can like kind of, kind of gauge like how complex this is to even decode one frame, how many blocks you have to process one by one by one by one until you just have one frame. And then you have to do that 24 or 50 or 60 times per second or even more. So you can, you can get a, an idea of how complex this is, right? So for each of the blocks, you have to transfer the loop and you can't skip it. They have to be processed one by one by one by one. Otherwise, you don't have the right information. Um, but I already showed some, some ways on how to parallelize this, right? For example, using slide, uh, slices. And there's also an example here. So this would be an example where there's multiple slices being decoded uh, in parallel. Um, and then the same for tiles. So this is how it would look like if you have multiple tiles, how uh, multiple decoders would work on this. Uh, and then lastly, I want to show uh, a, a video on, um, on something that I didn't mention before, which is wave fronts. This is something specific to HEVC, which is a technology where um, you're basically working. Yeah, it looks like a wave front going through the image, right? From the decoding standpoint. The idea is that um, if you're decoding a block, then the only restriction you really have is that the, uh, the left block, of course, the top left and the top and the top right block have to be already decoded. And then you can already start decoding of the current block with some exceptions to the, with some modifications to the entropy coding engine. Um, and then you can enable a decoder if he wants to, to basically launch as many threads as you can um, divided by this uh, two, two times ratio. Um, and then it looks a bit like a wave front going through the, through the image. So this is another way on how you can do parallel processing at the decoder side. Okay, something I, something I wanted to show, like a practical example is, um, is why you view. That's a tool that I developed. It's, it's open source, check it out on GitHub. Uh, and something that this can do is it can decode video, of course. Um, in this case, it's an HEVC stream, but it can also get us some advanced information from the decoded video. So for example, here on the right, we can see some things that we can, we can, we can display. So we can, um, for example, this is the first frame of the video sequence. We can enable the intradirection luma. So these are the luma directions, um, these, these uh, directions for the intra prediction. And uh, yeah, the, you can already see that um, a lot of the blocks, you can also see the different block sizes here, like for the sky where there's not much happening, we have bigger blocks and for like edges and things, we have much smaller blocks. And if we take a, if we zoom in a bit here then we can actually see something um, interesting that you can see that the directions here, for example, are, um, are like adapting to the edge, which is actually in the image. So you can see that the intra prediction is like following this edge with very small blocks. That seems to be a very efficient uh, thing in this case. Um, so this is for intra prediction and something else is also, we can also take a look at inter prediction. So if I go to frame nine here, for example, then we can activate the motion information for uh, both lists. Um, and now you can see that there's, uh, yeah, there's, there's different, there's the motion vectors uh, of each of these blocks. So all of them have been uh, predicted using motion compensation. And um, all of these blocks actually have two motion vectors. You, know, you can see that there's this bi-directional motion compensation happening from the temporal past and future. So it's actually going into both directions to form a prediction here. Um, just an example, if you want, uh, check this out. It's on GitHub and um, yeah, to see some insights of video codecs. 
All right, yeah, so I hope, I hope you learned something. I hope this was very helpful to you. Um, please share this video. Please um, share the material from this video. Everything is open source and available on, uh, on GitHub. Um, the Why View Player is also open source and, and open source on GitHub. Check that out. Uh, Sintel, that's from the CC Blender Foundation, the video that I used here. Uh, and all of the videos that you saw here, like the decoding videos and all of the loop filter videos and everything, it's all under CC and you can get them on YouTube and uh, use them for teaching material and whatever you want. So yeah, thanks and uh, have a good night.